Hi there, AP Calc AP students. Mr. Record here for the last video for our topic coverings 6, 7, and 6, 8. Going back to our good friend, the fundamental theorem of calculus, but we're going to look at the other part that we haven't paid quite attention, a bit of attention to here as of late. So let's take a look. So what we got here is a little bit of a uh, stroll down memory lane, if you recall from topics 6, 4, and 6, 5. The fundamental theorem of calc has this interesting byproduct that's illustrated here. If we have f of x that's continuous on an open interval, and that interval's i that contains this value a, then every single x that's in that interval i has this property. If we take the derivative of the integral with respect to x that runs from a to x of f of t dt, we get f of x. Now what we said to do is that basically the derivative and the integral kind of eat each other up. And we simply take this uh, x value that we have up here and it finds itself plugged into that t's position and boom, that is our answer. And so we can still work with that on a level where we deal with an expression. You know, before we were working with that, dealing with graphical representations of these integrals and finding area. Now we have the expression. So really, in the short, what we could simply do with problem 8a, the integration from 0 to x, t squared plus 1's derivative with respect to x, is take this x and replace the t with it, and boom, the answer is x squared plus 1. Now that seems kind of silly, doesn't it? That's kind of dumb. That's kind of easy. What's the catch? Well, there really is no catch. But I do want to show you that you can do this the long way, maybe the more predictable way, and it's still going to result in the same answer. So for example, what if we held off on taking this derivative just for a moment until we found this antiderivative with the boundaries. So we integrate t squared plus 1 with respect to t, and we get t cubed over 3 plus t. And then we will evaluate this from x down to 0 and see what we get. Meanwhile, the ddx is patiently waiting. By the time we replace our t's with x, we get this and replace our t's with zero, well, really nothing's going to come about from that, right? Now let's take this derivative. 3 in front cancels the 3 in the bottom. We now get x with 1 power less. Derivative of x is 1, and lo and behold, what do you know? These are the same. It's just that we don't have to do that long way if we remember that as long as this lower boundary is a constant, we can just replace the t with x. Same thing's going to apply for b here. Derivative with respect to x of the integral from 2 to x of 5t minus 3 with respect to t. Replace the t with x. Game over. Not bad. Now, if we take a slightly different turn here, the rule above takes a different turn when the upper limit is something besides x, as illustrated in example 9 here below. Evaluate the following. Let's get rid of that w2. What do you say? So evaluate the derivative with respect to x of this expression. OK, well, maybe, maybe we replace the t with x. Maybe that's all we do. OK, well, let's try that. If I replace the t with the entire upper boundary, well, maybe this is what my answer is going to be. But I tell you what, there's one surefire way to find out, and let's go with the long way here. So if we try this long way, we would go ahead and let our derivative sit and wait patiently. We'll integrate t plus 1 with respect to t. Plug in our boundaries, 5x squared to 0. And let's see what happens. Derivative sits and waits patiently again. If we were to plug 5x squared in for t, we'd have to square the 5x squared, which I believe would be 25x to the fourth over that 2. 
and if we plug 5x squared in for the t, of course we get 5x squared. Now we subtract, we plug 0 in, and again that's going to just give us 0. So if we take this derivative now, the 4 comes out in front. I suppose we could do a little reducing with the 2. There'd still be a 2 multiplied by the 25 to give us 50. Or you could think of 100 over 2. The x drops down to the third, and the 5x squared differentiates to be 10x. Now wait a minute, that does not look like that. Well, it's because we missed out on one extra step. If this upper boundary is a little bit more than just an x, you still go ahead and plug it in, but you've got to remember to finish by multiplying by its derivative. It's the chain rule. And now, if you take a good look at this answer that I've just circled, it is indeed the same as what we have down there. Of course, it's a factored version. doesn't really matter which way you want to write it as long as it's accurate. So that's the next little trick. If we look at part B, you've got your upper boundary that's a little bit more than just an x. Plug it in for the t as normal. So 3 times 2x cubed would be 6x cubed plus your 1. But don't stop there. We have to remember all of this would be multiplied by the derivative of that upper boundary, which is 6x squared. And once again, this will work regardless of if the lower boundary is a 0 or any other constant. It just needs to be a constant. If the lower boundary isn't a constant, well, all you'd do is just subtract and plug that value in for the t. Worst case scenario, the lower boundaries say something besides just x. Same thing. Plug whatever it is in for t, make sure it's subtracted, and then multiply it by its derivative. But it's very rare that you're going to see something like that. However, it is about a 100% guarantee that this will show up on the AP exam in May. Hope this helps. We'll see you at the next video.